People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the People's Platform. When we look at how societies pursue development, this concept shifts and evolves. It's interesting then to look at the role of the state, to look at the role of democracy in development, uh, the role of civil society and other stakeholders in development. In fact, the interrelationship between political and economic systems warrants our attention and comprehension. Tonight's topic of discussion is political economy of development. I'm so pleased to welcome to the studio for the first time researcher and political economist Dr. Devaka Gunawardana. Good evening and welcome to the show Devaka. Thank you very much Sonali. Glad to be here. Uh, Devaka, um, in the current context mm -hmm. that Sri Lanka is in and the current trajectory Sri Lanka is on, is it succeeding in achieving its development goals? So I think there have been a lot of very disruptive events that have occurred and we can go into the reasons later you know um, why Sri Lanka is in the crisis it's in, it's in right now um, but I think in terms of the current you know path for the economy it is looking very bad in terms of the development objectives um, you know for example at the start of the crisis um, Sri Lanka was locked out of the uh, international capital markets, so it lost a key source of its external financing, and it had to rely more on other sorts of interventions. Uh, later, you know, the IMF, obviously, the International Monetary Fund, you know, other multilateral donors, and they have come with a broad set of policy prescriptions. Um, but in my view, they are not really tackling the core issues behind the crisis, which is it is a depression. And so what we mean by a depression is that there has been a contraction of the economy over successive quarters and years. And so to be able to restore the economy to where it was before the crisis even happened requires a lot of intervention, including on the part of the state. But unfortunately, due to these prescriptions right now, um, Sri Lanka is really hobbled. And so even now, you know, they have asked, uh, you know, uh, the government and various other actors are, are considering uh, sort of um, changing Sri Lanka's uh, status from a middle income to a lower income country, right? And so what does this mean for development? if you followed these policies over the past several decades and essentially you're going backwards, right? You're not going forwards. You're now saying, okay, we need to actually, you know, change our status so that we can unlock more concessional aid. I, I think that's a pretty uh, strong indictment of, of those policies that led to this point. And it's not just over the past couple of years. I think that a lot of people will focus on you know, obviously the previous government led by Gotabaya Rajapaksa, but actually it's been decades in the making, in my view. And again, we can uh, explore those issues further. So. Um, Devaka, the, uh, it's important for us to connect the economic theories with actual policies and lived realities at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. So if a portion of the population is going hungry, what's the point of flaunting development? Right. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, this is where there has been a lot of talk about stabilization, you know, through the uh, different reform programs. Uh, but we still see in the social indicators how devastating the crisis is, you know, the fact that the poverty rate has doubled, right? The fact that, you know, even in uh, whichever year, 2022, you know, household food insecurity had dramatically risen. And so, I, and even, you know, issues like child malnutrition. So I think you're absolutely right that when we frame this question, we also have to ask, you know, what statistics matter? And so, you know, even the calculation of inflation, for example, it depends on what's called a base effect. So that means that, you know, if inflation was very high in 2022, then it can still look like it's declining in the following year because it was so high the previous year. The way it's measured is calculated based on the previous year. But the overall hike in the cost of living is essentially, it's permanent now, right? I mean, you go into a store, you look at the goods, everything has doubled or tripled, including you know electricity, basic services. So I, I, I think this, this rhetoric or, or this 
sort of uh, framing in terms of stabilization doesn't capture all these other lived realities for people who are still experiencing the worst effects of the crisis. Are we looking at economic recovery in uh, too much of a simplistic manner or is it that the masses don't understand the, the gravity and depth of the multidimensional nature of the multiplicity of crises? What, what is it? So I think you're always going to have people from different classes, different backgrounds, uh, with different viewpoints, right? And so, you know, not just in Colombo, but across the island, if, if you have other types of assets, if, if you, you know, uh, have other, you know, money coming in, you might think, okay, there, you know, the, this crisis, it, it's, it's essentially not as bad as it was at the height of, you know, the fuel queues and all that in 2022. Um, but for people whose livelihoods, for example, depend on uh, kerosene, which uh, my uh, colleague Ahilan Kadirgamar and I, we, you know, wrote about this, you know, in 2022, the price of kerosene quadrupled, right? And so that affects fisher folk, that affects farmers who rely on that. And so, again, if, if you're talking about, you know, how this is experienced, yes, it very much depends on your class and uh, other elements of your background and, and so again I think you know people will perceive it differently but broadly speaking I do believe there is a, a much bigger space uh, for demands for relief and again we can talk about what exactly that means because I think people have also or certain let's say elite sections have this idea that you know, the masses always want handouts, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a really unfair understanding of the challenges people face because, you know, everyone wants to be an active participant in the economy, mm -hmm. right? Everyone has different goals in their own life. And the question is whether they can achieve them. And so if you have a system that, let's say, depends on subsidies so that people can have access to electricity, then if you're really concerned about, you know, the overall sustainability of that system, I don't think the goal should be to take away what little people already have. It should be to ask, okay, what sorts of more redistributive programs can we pursue that will, you know, in a way make society more egalitarian, more egalitarian you know, sure. more, more equal? Because at the end of the day, I think, you know, the working people of this country, of Sri Lanka, have produced a tremendous amount of wealth. We've seen that with the garment workers, the tea plantation workers, you know, even people working abroad. I mean, they have earned so much money. And as always, the question is, where has it gone, right? Mm -hmm. The role of the state mm -hmm. in development. Yeah. It's um, a bit of a contentious one. It's something that's also evolving. It keeps evolving because there is now a, a greater understanding of citizens' involvement in governance, right. in development as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the state is a very sort of complex actor. Um, you know, I, I don't think we can reduce, reduce it to one thing or the other. You know, I think different policies will favor, for example, upper classes. You know, there are you know, a few policies maybe that will, you know, benefit, uh, you know, the working people or whoever it is. But at the end of the day, what really sort of um, changes or shapes the state are those struggles on the ground. And so, you know, even demands like the food subsidy. Okay, the food subsidy initially came about, let's say, during World War II, right? The British installed a, a ration system, right, to mm -hmm. cope with potential shortages. But later on, it became something that people felt entitled to, right? And they even fought for it, you know, in the Great Hartal of 1953. And so like that, I think state programs can also, people can develop an, a sense of ownership of them where they actually fight for these policies, you know, especially, for example, free education and free health care. But, you know, the state also can go in the other direction where, you know, elites, you know, other groups will use the state for their own ends. And we can see that even with how the state itself became financialized, okay, after, you know, the 2007 era, you know, when they started issuing sovereign bonds, 
This was the Sri Lankan government that was issuing these bonds, but these were speculative assets that, you know, hedge funds, you know, other, um, you know, financial actors purchased. And then who was responsible when the value of those bonds collapsed, right? It was put on the people, right? And so like that, you know, it can be a, a socially a way of distributing wealth upwards, socializing costs, as they say, privatizing benefits, socializing costs. So again, when we look at the state, we, we should never just assume it's neutral or even, you know, I think, you know, some people who have a, a more dogmatic perspective, you know, may say, oh, you know, state intervention is always bad. No, it's the question of what kind of state intervention, right? Is it really actually working on behalf of the masses, the, the broad majority of people, or is it really about distributing wealth upwards? Devika, um, something that happens um, not just in Sri Lanka but across the world and something which shouldn't happen is the state being mm -hmm. pitted against the people. Right. Um, and systems don't function in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So it requires the interdependence, interrelationship between the varying actors to ensure development. Right. Uh, how hard is it for this to happen in a practical sense? Yeah, so like I said, I think that struggles really um, shape the state. And, and those can be struggles over many different issues. It could be over ethnic issues. It could be over class issues. Um, and there's, there's also not just the internal dimension, but there's an external dimension too. You know, the Sri Lankan state is embedded in a world system, as we call it. You know, it's embedded in a global order where Sri Lanka obviously does not have the same power on the global level as, say, the U.S. or China. China. But at the same time, how do we um, think about whole, how all these factors sort of constrain the state. And so I would argue that, you know, again, there are a lot of um, limitations even within the state, but really it's when people have very strong demands, right? Demands that, you know, other, other groups in society, elites, whoever cannot ignore, that that's when you have a, a question about, okay, well, how can we rebuild the state, reconstruct the state, in a way that it's able to meet the needs of the people. And, you know, this broadly is in line even with, um, uh, you know, this concept of a developmental state. You know, in East Asia, after World War II, obviously there had been tremendous destruction, right? In China, Japan, various places. And so um, there was a growing body of scholarship later on, much later, say in the 1980s and onwards, that recognized that the state had to fulfill a developmental mission. It had to meet the, the social aspirations, right? The, the, the demands of the people. And now the way they managed to do that was technically by, by you know, having a, a very strong form of state intervention, but that was still disciplined by other factors. For example, you know, the South Korean government may have provided subsidies or incentives to exporters, but they also required that they meet targets, right, in terms of, you know, the international market. And they had access to those markets through their alliance with the United States. So it's a, it's a very complex question. So even the developmental state doesn't exist in a vacuum, but it is a question of whether a state can take advantage of what little opportunity for maneuver it may have. All yeah. right. Uh, we are in conversation with researcher Dr. Deva Kukunawadana. We're going for a break. We'll be right back. platform <laughs> Jalapiramia Tikka. Come at the Rattle Nagana 
ಜನಪ್ ಪೌರ ದೇಶ ಬಾಂಧುಥೇನ್ ಕೋನ್ ಅಪಾಯಿಂಟೆಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಥರ್ಟಿ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಜನರಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೊಲೀಸ್ ಹರಾಂದೇನಿಯ ಚೀಫ್ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ ಹೆಲ್ತ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟರ್ ಶಾರ್ಟ್ ಡೆಡ್ will resign and join the people if pressurized by india over indo lanka fisher folk issue says fisheries minister no confidence motion moved against the speaker parliament sectoral oversight committee recommends electricity tariff reduction by at least over 20% Minister Nimal Siripala De Silva and State Minister Sisira Jayakodi face opposition over lack of solutions. TV1 TV for life. people's platform welcome back our topic of discussion tonight is political economy of development uh they were um when we talk about the uh, development paradigm uh, we can't forget that sri lanka exists in a much larger ecosystem and the world around us is in turmoil in such a backdrop how is sri lanka supposed to navigate its way through this absolute yeah i would even call it a, a growing state of chaos mm. really i mean i we the term we use uh, often is global unraveling but it is essentially this idea that you know we're not going to pretend that the previous world order was that much better i mean it was defined by you know us unilateral action especially the invasion of iraq right i mean but but at the same time there was this idea that in theory at least multilateral institutions existed that were meant to sort of coordinate and solve these global problems albeit under the US's hegemony the issue now is that even though the US's hegemony is declining right and we've seen that with for example the russian invasion of ukraine um it doesn't necessarily mean things are getting better right it can also lead to more chaos and more disorder. So, you know, this is in many ways we can go further back and argue that it's really about the moment in the 1970s when there was a crisis. There were alternatives that were being proposed. Um even Sri Lanka's own Gamani Korea was part of the development of an initiative for the new international economic order which would allow um sort of uh smaller, uh, you know, third world countries to coordinate and to get better prices for the goods they exported. Okay. Um but all these um were sort of uh, initiatives were squashed, right? By what we can broadly call neoliberalism, mm. right? This idea that the free market is dominant, it should determine essentially uh, everything about um these societies. And so what ended up happening though was that it created simultaneously the tendencies for this unraveling because as the US started relying more for example on finance you know on you know speculation abroad and you know taking these more unilateral actions like invading you know other countries it really undermined whatever uh, sorts of institutions had emerged out of world war 2 right and we call these the bread and woods institutions mm-hmm. you know the international monetary fund the world bank and so i think at the end of the day 
you know, if we're talking about how Sri Lanka can navigate this turmoil, this goes back to the previous point I was making about the developmental state. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really about the question of how can the state navigate these challenges by engaging with the demands of the people. And, you know, there's no sort of uh, single answer, right? You know, even when you talk about something like, you know, trade liberalization, like Sri Lanka needs to expand its presence abroad, needs to, you know, uh, sign more free trade agreements, whatever it is, uh, you know, even mainstream scholars, you know, the sort of the, the major deans of globalization studies, like Danny Roderick, like Joseph Stiglitz, they're now starting to put out even more uh, work, which is questioning this assumption. And, and again, going back to this idea, it's about timing, it's about sequences. And in Sri Lanka's case right now, the critical need is food, food security, right? So if you're talking just simply about, you know, going back to this old, old export model, it, it really relies on a world that no longer exists, right? Like I said, this, let's say, 1990s, right after the Cold War era, when the U.S. was in charge, essentially. It was called a period of hyper-globalization, right? Global trade growth was booming. We're no longer in that period. And it's not just because of the pandemic. It's because of all these other factors like war, that are starting to threaten this entire system. And so Sri Lanka really has to be very agile in how it deals with these challenges. And we can't just rely on any dogma that says, you know, okay, Sri Lanka needs to liberalize because that's the only way to get access to, you know, this global market, for example. Uh, your response leads me mm -hmm. to my next question. Mm -hmm. The government as a problem mm -hmm. and as a solution. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, when we talk about reforms, for example, I think we have to be very clear there are different types of reforms. There are redistributive reforms and there are regressive reforms. As I mentioned earlier, you know, you can have sort of the upward distribution of wealth through the state. You know, even when you're talking about privatization of public assets, you know, who buys those assets, right? And, you know, are they actually going to invest long term in the kind of capital formation that the country needs? And so if we're thinking about the state as, you know, as both um, sort of a, a positive actor or a negative actor, I would say, again, at the end of the day, it's going to be disciplined or really shaped by the struggles that are occurring, you know, whether whether people have formulated demands that require policymakers to develop an effective response. You know, right now, I think the way our policymaking works, it's very secluded, it's very insulated. Mm -hmm. It's this idea like we have unique access to this sort of technocratic knowledge that no one else really understands. And, you know, masses are always driven by their sort of animal desires, whatever. But as Keynes himself said about capital, capital is about the animal spirits, right? Investors also have their own incentives, their own speculative ideas. And if they're coming to Sri Lanka, we have to think, okay, what policy framework is in place that is actually going to channel that investment into productive areas? If you just say, oh, let's bring in direct foreign investment, that itself is not a strategy, okay? That's just rhetoric. You need to actually say, we have a development vision in mind and we are asking for different types of investment, but focused on these areas because these are the areas that are going to meet our people's needs. So again, I think if you look at the existing sort of assumptions, yeah, I, I think that, you know, again, the state unfortunately can have a pretty big impact on people in, in, in a less positive way. But I think we have to look back to also those examples where, you know, again, Sri Lanka was able to achieve major goals, you know, achieve higher human development indicators through things like free education, free health care. And if those institutions have now declined or if they're now experiencing crises because of, for example, underfunding, then let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's focus on other types of reforms that can develop a, a stronger mission oriented sense, as some academics would say, within the state so that it can actually provide the services people need. 
Political apathy can be a major stumbling block. We see um, sections of our society, um, people saying things like, oh, look, I won't be affected by the 60% uh, increase in electricity tariffs, or I don't care if I can't eat my regular cheeses because I'm not affected. So this political apathy and uh, disinterest and disengagement in um, decision making that affects the lives of all of us, how big of a stumbling block is it? Well, let's just use the first example, the electricity. You know, what does it mean if, you know, over half a million households were disconnected from the electricity grid um, last year alone, okay, because of the increase in tariffs and, and whatnot? Um, we live in a society you know, and this was, you know, the neoliberal doctrine always claimed there was no society. To use Margaret Thatcher's famous phrase, right, the UK Prime Minister, she said, there is no such thing as society. Well, as we're discovering in this crisis, there very much is something called society, and people rely on each other. So even, you know, the informal workers, the people who staff the shops, the people who run these businesses who are, who are essentially providing all these services, if they can, can't survive, how can you survive? We are connected. It, there is a, essentially a form of interdependency that we need to cultivate a stronger sense or awareness of. And I think at the end of the day, you know, the concept we would use is solidarity, right? That we need to develop a, an idea of an economy based on principles of solidarity. Um, so, you know, and I'll end by saying, if we don't, you know, there is always a grave possibility that what you consider economic stability now can become instability later. You know, why do riots happen? Why do strikes happen? Why does other disruptive protest happen? It's because people's demands are not being met. And so somehow, you know, and there are obviously other framings, you know, it can be framed in a, in a, a sort of more nationalistic or even xenophobic way, or it can be framed in a progressive way. But either way, we need to address the underlying causes and issues. And again, if people can't survive, then I am very worried about the future of this country. Dr. Devaka Gunawadana, thank you thank very you, much for coming in to thank share you. your perspectives. Thank you very much, Sonali. Thank you for watching us. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>